when you're thinking about your customers and their journey, uh, that you understand uh, what those key moments of truth are and, and, and asking those kind of diagnostic questions is helpful uh, because that's going to that's gonna help you um, kind of plan your process, uh, but also a- address uh, you know, shortcomings. If you want to drastically improve your business, learn proven growth strategies, and generate sustained results for your organization, you've come to the right place. Welcome to the Innovation Junkies Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Innovation Junkies Podcast. My name's Jeff Standridge. Hey, and this is Jeff Amrine. Glad to be back. Well, what are we doing today, Jeff? We, we've got an absolutely fantastic guy on that, that, I'll, that I'll tell you in full disclosure, I've known for more than 40 years. We were both Naval Academy graduates and, and I've actually known him since about 1981. But let me tell you a little wow. bit about his background. So Mike Vermillion is a senior managing director with J.D. Powers Global Business Intelligence Group. He is responsible for the growth of the segment's business by leading growth initiatives and key capability developments. He's a key thought leader in customer service excellence. He recently authored a forthcoming book that's called J.D. Power's Guide to the Net Promoter Score. And we're all familiar with Net Promoter. That's really cool. He's got a lot of depth of experience in that area. He brings more than 25 years experience in the organization's strategy and product management fields. Prior to joining J.D. Power, he held senior executive roles in a number of big companies like Procter & Gamble, uh, Dun & Bradstreet, Navex Global, Market uh, Risk Partners, He's a Naval Academy graduate and a University of Chicago uh, MBA. So we're really glad to have Mike Vermillion on with us today. Hey, Mike. Hey, guys. How you doing? Very, very good. As I I often say, if I were were any better, I'd have to be twins. (laughs) Now, great great to have you with us today. You're joining us from out west, as we would say here in the the Mid-South. Yeah, we're, uh, I'm based in Southern California. I uh, moved out here in 2015 uh, after spending many, many years in the New York City area. So we're uh, pretty happy with the uh, the weather at this point. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Well, Mike, before we get started, uh, we like to have a random musing on our, uh, on our podcast, and it has nothing to do with anything we're going to be talking about in the podcast necessarily. It could, I guess. Um, but uh, today's random musing is what technology from a science fiction movie would you most like to have? Yeah, you know, um, I can't remember the name of the movie off the top of my head. You guys probably know it, but it's that um, movie about the pre-crime unit uh, where mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the ball is um, etched and then it kind of rolls down and, and, and then it's got the name of the person who's about to commit a crime. And then the pre-crime unit goes out and helicopters in and prevents the crime that was going to happen. Uh, and just, I just remember that technology. I think it was Tom Cruise, maybe, uh, where he's at the, the uh, at the Minority, minority Report. Minority What's Report. Minority, minority report. report. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you remember that technology where he's, it's a, like a whiteboard or something, but he's, he's got the different, um, um, things on the board and he's kind of moving them around with his hands mm-hmm. and uh, uh, it's all kind of connected. I, I thought that was really cool. Um, I don't know Microsoft Surface uh, tried to replicate that at one point, but uh, we'd love to see that technology come to life. Oh, that's pretty cool. Very good. What, How about yeah. you, Amron? Yeah. Yeah. And so, so I was sitting here thinking about it. Of course, the obvious one is I'd love to have a, a personal warp drive and a rocket, right? So that I could, travel through space. I think that'd be interesting. It's a little aspirational there. But I would say the other one is there was a movie called Altered Carbon, which was kind of intriguing, where they looked at sort of our our flesh and our body as a skin, they called it, and your your essence and your soul were, were in this disc that would kind of pop into the back of your neck. And so if you wanted to go from being a, a fat old man like I am now to somebody that's, you know, 6'5 with 0% body fat, totally possible with that technology so there you I, go I think cool. <laughs> very interesting yeah what about um, you jeff well so i um 
mine's pretty basic. I've, I've been, become a fan of aviation over the last 12 months or so and, and started flying quite a lot. And so, um, I, I think, you know, the, the accessibility of a flying automobile, you can kind of like George Jetson, right. Uh, where I could hop in and, and, uh, you know, have my car parked here and I could drive down the street or I could say, you know what, traffic's really bad here. I think I'm going to get up at about 1500 feet and I'm just going to bypass it all. But just the, the time saving, uh, that, that occurs when you're, you know, and I'm not talking about commercial flight. I'm talking about, you know, when you have aviation available at your, at your fingertips, uh, no TSA check-in, uh, no traffic, be able to get up, get down. And, and uh, that, I think that would be mine. Yeah, complete autopilot too. It's totally autonomous. Yeah. So if you want to have a few bourbons on the way to wherever you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would require new technology, which would you know, which would require uh, FDA, uh, FAA approval, I guess. You know, but uh, anyway. I think so. I think so that's right. Yeah. So, uh, Mike, great to have you with us today, and and I want to start with with uh, one of your kind of forethought areas in, in the you know we're one of the thought leaders in the areas of customer service excellence, and I'd, I'd maybe like to just start there in terms of, you know, how do you describe, you know, in your experience, some of the major tenets of of customer service excellence? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so I lead the customer service excellence practice here at uh, JD Power, and so we uh, eat live and breathe this stuff uh, every day. Uh, we're out working with the biggest uh, brands in the, uh, the country and across different industries to uh, address this question. So I think um, an important starting point is that uh, you want to be customer focused. And by being customer focused, we don't necessarily mean just a letter or a memo from the CEO just telling the organization to do better. Uh, but really, the organization needs to have a true understanding of what is important to customers and what matters most to them. That's, that's really kind of the starting point. Um, from there, you, you have to recognize that your customers or whether they're B2B customers or, or if you're a B2C business and you're, you're, you're thinking about consumers, uh, they're going to be judging you and judging their customer experience with your brand or your company, uh, not based on necessarily your competitor, uh, but it's really gonna be based on their last best experience anywhere. Uh, and so nobody gets off the phone with the bank and, and says, hey, that was a uh, pretty good phone call for a bank. Uh, what they are comparing that to is their last great experience at Amazon or their last great experience with Zappos. Uh, so that's really kind of a, a starting point. Very good. Uh, Talk you, about you, well, well, no, go, go ahead, ahead Jeff. Jeff. Well, I was, I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, no, no. I, this happens to me all the time. People love talking about customer experience. Uh, and uh, as soon as they find out what I do for a living, um, I hear their last great horror story uh, about uh, being on hold with the, uh, wealth management firm or uh, the last awful experience they had, you know, checking in for their flight or whatever. So, but yeah, yeah we'll dive into it. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say, so, so in, you, you've developed this, this depth of experience around uh, customer experience and around customer service excellence. Talk to us a little bit about this new book that you're going to release and net promoter score and how that can be uh, parlayed to, you know, to great effect and impact for, for businesses. Yeah. And that, that promoter score. So we, um, so this is a book we're, we're working on. We have, we do have an active practice around it. Uh, uh, JD power doesn't lead with net promoter score. We, we lead with something called customer satisfaction. Uh, but we support net promoter score because, uh, a lot of our clients are interested in it and they've got it deployed in some, in some fashion. So just to, the, the reason we're working uh, on a, a book about it uh, is because uh, Net Promoter Score or MPS is uh, a really simple concept, uh, but it's also very complex at the same time. Uh, what we find is that um, uh, you know, executives like it because it's easy to understand, easy to explain. Uh, it's easy to uh, uh, train the front line on it. It's, it's easy for the front line to understand you know, what it is. Uh, but uh, some of the things you have to think about when you're using MPS as a measure 
of, um, and it's not really satisfaction, it's really about loyalty and advocacy, uh, is number one, uh, the math behind it is actually torturous. Uh, and it leaves out a large chunk of your customer base because it's only looking at the promoters and detractors. It's leaving out the neutrals. Uh, another, so, so Mike, uh, let, let, let me ahead. interrupt you there. If, if you would just give our listeners a brief summary of net promoter. I know Jeff and I are familiar with it and we use it, but give our listeners just a brief summary of what it is. And then I want to pick up where we left off. Yeah. It's a, so MPS is uh, based on a, a scale of uh, negative 100 to positive 100. And what you do is you, uh, go out and, and um, ask uh, on a scale of zero to 10, um, would you recommend a, a brand to uh, family and friends? So it's, it's a highly personal question. And um, the uh, people at the top, say uh, nines and tens are considered promoters and the people at the bottom, um, for exactly what the range is, but something like zero to four, zero to five are considered detractors. Everybody else is a neutral. And the actual calculation is um, the promoters minus uh, the detractors. And then you multiply yeah. by here and that's your MPS um, result. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. And so, so we were talking about the actual NPS and the deployment and use, use of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's, so the, the NPS question is typically the first question in a, uh, in a survey. Uh, it's typically mm -hmm. accompanied by a, um, a second kind of open-ended question, which asks, why did you give us that MPS uh, rating? Um, so that's kind of text and then text analytics. Uh, but in the end, um, once you know your MPS result, uh, the next question is, what do we do with it? How do we improve mm -hmm. it? Right. And um, what we find companies doing is they'll, they'll try to do some data mining around those open-ended uh, questions. Uh, they'll uh, start asking the question, who, which group do we focus on? Do we focus on the promoters and kind of advancing them? Uh, do we focus on the detractors and figure out how to kind of save those customers? Or do we focus on the neutrals and move them into the promoter category? Uh, but beyond that, it's just not very actionable. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, what you really want to do is uh, build out what we call an MPS drivers model and that's something that we do in our research because we include the MPS question in our benchmark studies. Uh, and then from there, we go explore the different aspects of the customer journey. We're able to build out an MPS driver's uh, model so we can uh, tell you exactly what's driving uh, the MPS uh, result. And, and your book, is your book outlining uh, some, of the, some of the aspects of that and how to, how to actually deploy the score, how to use the score, how to mine the data around it? Or tell us a little more about your... Yeah, your that, that, that's exactly right, Jeff. So, we're, so, 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 so there's different aspects to it. Um, one of the things we do is we're partnered with the Drucker Institute who publishes a uh, report every year on the best run companies uh, in America and uh, we contribute the, uh, the MPS data and the customer satisfaction data uh, to that study. Uh, as part of that relationship, uh, we go out and work with companies that are measuring MPS themselves and just uh, verify that they're doing it the right way. So a part of the book is focused on the science aspect and the actual measurement. And there's, there's rules around sample and calculation and, and uh, different aspects that way. Uh, but another big chunk of it is um, what you're doing with the results and how you're kind of communicating those to executives, how you're communicating that to the organization uh, in a way that's not, not only correct, but also, you know, actionable and, and it makes sense. So, so we're, it's kind of a 360 view of um, uh, the measurement and, and then how to make it actionable. And so whom, whom do you hope will, will adopt this book and, and use it in its best and highest form? Uh, so that's a great question. So a couple different groups. So there is a uh, typically a, a group inside the organization that is focused on um, measurement and um, insights and analysis around the customer experience. So that's mm -hmm. kind of one group. Uh, but a second group will be the executives and the people running the businesses themselves who are getting mm -hmm. these MPS results from uh, the CX uh, group and then kind of scratching their heads with, OK, now now what do I do with this and how do I improve it? Got it. Got it. Yeah. So your 
your role today is is in the uh, Global Business Intelligence Group within JD right. Power and Associates. So, right. talk to us a little bit about your role in the organization and and what 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 is a day in the life of of Mike look like? <laughs> yeah, so our uh, so, so uh, GBI at JD Power, uh, what we do is we cover uh, all of the uh, industries outside of automotive uh, that involve customer service. Uh, so we're um, interviewing about 5 million customers a year, uh, asking mm -hmm. them between 100 and 120 questions. And so we're, we're collecting millions and millions of data points around customer journeys and customer satisfaction, uh, publishing close to 200 uh, benchmark studies uh, across different industries. Uh, our biggest practices are in financial services, so banking and credit card, wealth management, lending. Uh, we're also in insurance, mostly in the property and casualty space. Uh, we cover uh, a little bit of healthcare. We do cover the travel and hospitality space, the utilities industry. Um, so it's it's pretty wide ranging. Uh, each of the way we're organized is each of these practices have um, subject matter experts with a deep experience in that particular vertical. And the role that I play and that my team plays is we actually go across all the different industries uh, with a focus on customer service. Uh, and a lot of that involves the contact center. Uh, so the, uh, the interaction you have with what's called an IVR or interactive voice response, but also the phone conversations you're having with agents. Uh, but that even extends to the interactions you're having with a bank or an insurance company or an airline uh, via chat or chatbot, uh, with social media, uh, even uh, your um, experience on the website uh, or with an app. Uh, so we're... Um, wide ranging in our team in terms of our industry focus and then also the different channels that we cover. Across these various industries that you, you look at when all these different uh, mechanisms of, of interacting with customers and, and, you, you know, net pr promoter score is one of the sort of uh, KPIs or measures that give some indication that they're doing things right. But talk about, is there, is there a pretty high correlation between the culture, the core culture of the company and where they are on that, uh, that customer service spectrum. And, and, you know, you'd worry a little bit that, that the customer service piece, if you just focus on that and there's not things in the culture that are addressed, it might be just a, a veneer or a Band-Aid. Talk, talk about the connection between culture and customer experience. Yeah, it, 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 it's a strong connection. Uh, basically, the idea is that uh, if you have pissed off employees, um, you're not going to have happy customers. It's, it's, just, it's just that simple. Uh, and so you, you really want to pay a lot of attention uh, to your employee base uh, to make sure that they're uh, engaged, uh, that they're not focused on uh, quitting, which we're seeing quite a bit of a, an uptick in uh, over the past six months uh, across the U.S., um, that... Um, not only, um, and in, in, by engagement, we, we mean not just the, the typical culture stuff of, of um, making sure everybody's getting the annual employee survey and, 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 the, and the company is being responsive to that, but making sure that you're hiring uh, the right way, that you're training your people properly, that they're getting proper coaching and uh, development. So we, when we are working with an organization that's struggling uh, with um, uh, customer satisfaction, that is one of the things we look at is uh, employee engagement, but also uh, how well you're communicating with your employees and, and, and with the, if the will is there, uh, but also if the skill is there. So are they getting the proper training, the proper tools to do their job? Let's, let's shift our focus a little bit and talk about, um, you know, the, the use of business intelligence. I know that you're uh, leading a number of growth initiatives and and capability developments and new market entry. Let's talk about the role of business intelligence in developing strategy. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Jeff. So we do a lot of strategic work um, because of the of, of the of our um, the nature of our studies, which tend to be annual uh, and 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 uh, kind of longitudinal in, in nature. So we're looking at kind of trends over time. Uh, we're also looking at the uh, competitive landscape. So in terms of, of strategy, uh, our starting point always is the customer. Uh, so what's important to the customer and understanding what's important to them. Uh, and then kind of breaking that down 
in terms of uh, what we call factors and attributes, uh, but also in terms of key moments of truth. Uh, so, for example, um, you're waiting in line at Starbucks uh, for a cup of coffee. Uh, we would ask you, how satisfied were you with the amount of time that you had to wait in line? Uh, but we also ask, how many minutes did you actually wait in line? And we're always surprised, like at Starbucks, that people are happy standing in line for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. It's not that big of a deal you know, to them. But in other industries, like at a hotel when you're going to check in, uh, what we find is that there's a break point uh, at about the four minute mark uh, where uh, hmm. people are kind of happy to stand in line for up to four minutes. And then once you get past four minutes, uh, satisfaction just drops off the table like a rock. And it's really important that um, when you're thinking about your customers and their journey, uh, that you understand uh, what those key moments of truth are and, and, and asking those kind of diagnostic questions is helpful uh, because that's going to that's gonna help you um, kind of plan your process, uh, but also address uh, you know shortcomings. So that that's that's it. That's the starting point. Um, next area to go then would be to understand the competitive landscape. So uh, mm. where is the competition, and then where are you relative to your competition? Uh, and then we break that. What we do is we break that down again by factor, attribute, key moment of truth, and what we're looking for are the gaps. And then uh, the, and, and the gaps are really kind of opportunities for improvement, right? Um, from there, in terms of strategy setting, uh, it's really important to focus. Uh, the mistake we see are companies that have a laundry list of things that they're trying to fix, and there's not really kind of no prioritization. Uh, so prioritization is really important. Uh, what we, the way we prior, help our clients prioritize is by looking at what's going to move the needle the most in the shortest period of time at the least cost. Those are kind of the three things that we take uh, into consideration. Uh, but once you've got that prioritization done, now you've got a roadmap uh, that you can act on. So, so that's kind of the, the, the strategy development aspect. Got it. Very good. Yeah. Where do you see all this as you think about all, all that you're doing? Wh what are some of the interesting things that are coming out in terms of innovation that are going to change the way we think about customer journey and the use of business intelligence to kind of give us the crystal ball view of the next five or so years of how some of this might change. Yeah. So a couple of things. So, so one thing we see a lot is uh, the movement to what is called self-service. And so uh, this is everyone's holy grail that the customers can figure out how to serve themselves uh, so that you don't have to staff a large, you know, call center or contact center to do customer support. Uh, the the problem with that we see is that um, uh, the the big investment and in, in the movement towards self service. What and, and self service would be uh, having a great interactive voice response system, having a great website, having a great app. Uh, anticipating what the questions are going to be so you can answer them before they're even asked. Uh, but the problem we're seeing is that um, the technology people have kind of taken this over uh, and, and their solution oftentimes is optimized from a technology point of view and not from the customer point of view. And so it can, um, it can be frustrating for customers to, to, um, and, and, you, and, and I'm sure you guys have experienced this when you call into a company and you start going through the menus where you have to press the buttons. And uh, it's happened to me where I, I, I've got a menu and the thing that I'm calling about, it's not on the menu. It's, it's, not, one of right. the, it's not one of the options, right? <laughs> so, I, so I just find myself screaming into the phone, you know, operator, help, zero, whatever. <laughs> what's the magic escape pod to get out of this, uh, you know, this menu? So, um, uh, what we recommend is that is, is you know, don't hide that option. Uh, make sure that it's easy for a customer to punch out of that menu and get to a live person uh, yeah. that um, that has a huge impact on customer satisfaction. And in the end, you'll be surprised that customers, especially with the the, the younger generations, they, they, they don't really like talking to people anyway. So, so they, they're more than happy to self-serve. 
Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, if you haven't self if you haven't set self service up in a way that's comprehensive and anticipates all the needs, you need to have that option to talk to a live person and, and make it easy. How about those uh, self service options where it's literally just a form on a website? And there's no phone number to be found. There's no way to interact with them in real time via even a chat bot or, uh, or, or anything like that. It's literally just a, a, an email form basically on a, on a uh, website. Yeah. That can be scary and frustrating, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So, so yeah, if that, if that's your approach and, and I, I think there's a couple of well-known companies out there that, that we, that we know that kind of take that approach. Um, they're pretty confident in um, kind of ease of use of their of their products and um, and and aren't too concerned about it. Uh, I think what you'll find is that um, communities will develop uh, where people are helping each other. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I know if I have an issue uh, with anything to do with uh, you know Google, um, I'm going to Google my question and I'm going to find a community who's already kind of lived through that problem uh, mm -hmm. and has. Uh, you know, has an answer for me. Um, so, so, so that's, and then, you know, that's kind of my advice for consumers, uh, for, for companies. Um, if, if that's the approach you want to take, uh, I would, I would suggest that they um, actually um, promote the uh, communities and, and support them. Uh, and that can be, that can be a real strategy, right? So uh, sometimes mm -hmm. the, the communities are uh, picking up the issues faster than what you can internally. And uh, they might be coming up with uh, solutions that uh, your team hasn't thought of. Yeah, even the video guidance, you know, the YouTube video guidance. A lot of times we'll find myself, it's like, forget about trying to get a hold of whoever the manufacturer is. If it's some kind of issue with a piece of equipment, just find a YouTube instructional video about what to do. And invariably, there's going to be a lot of stuff there. You, you would think if the companies would curate that a little bit, right. it's in a way community-based customer service that they didn't have to pay for other than a little bit of curation of what's good and what isn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I always forget about YouTube. I, we had a, we had a leaky toilet. And so I, um, uh, took the, I took the thing completely apart. Uh, I went down to the hardware store and I, I bought the most expensive <laughs> repair kit possible. Uh, and then I get back and, and I'm putting the whole thing back together again. And there was like, there was like a screw or something. I couldn't figure out, you know, which way it went on. So I just, uh, let me go to YouTube and figure this out. And yeah. then I, I found a guy who had the exact same uh, toilet, the exact same issue. And uh, it turned out that you just needed to replace a, a washer. And there was an 84 year old grandmother who put in the comments of the YouTube video, thank you so much. You know, I, I, I fixed this in uh, a minute and a half and it cost me 50 cents. And I was <laughs> so embarrassed uh, for myself that uh, I had thought of going to YouTube. <laughs> See, this uh, is the problem of being a mechanical engineer, right? That's right. <laughs> As an engineer, you want to like take it apart and put it back together. Exactly. Again. Yeah, that's great. You know, Mike, you 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 do a lot of work in helping companies um, create strategy. One of the things that Jeff and I have observed is the the gap in a lot of companies executing that strategy and okay. and and executing it persistently through to completion and fruition. Uh, can you talk about, do you guys do any work in, with your clients in, in terms of actually taking that strategy to the next step through execution? And, and how do you go about that? Yeah, Jeff, that's a great question. We actually do a lot of work in this area because we, we work with um, a lot of Fortune 100 companies who've got huge staffs, tons of MBAs. They're great at um, analytics and data and planning. Uh, but where we see the biggest companies kind of falling down is around execution and execution of strategy. So the three areas that we look at, uh, that we help them look at, uh, are uh, starting with what we call will, which is the question, do you actually have buy-in from the organization around the strategy? Uh, and so that a lot of that has to do with, you know, communications. And are you communicating properly? Um, have you um, thought about how the strategy uh, impacts customers, but also impacts your, your, your organization and your frontline employees. So, so will is number one. Second is skill. So do, do, does your organization have the training that they need to actually execute on? Uh, and that, do they actually have the tools that they need you know, to do their job? 
Uh, a third thing to look at is, um, and, and this is something a client pointed out to me, uh, was actual capacity. Uh, so uh, if you've got somebody who's working 40 hours a week uh, and you're asking them to take one more thing onto the wagon to, uh, to execute, uh, do they have the capacity to do that? Uh, and then the, the third piece of, of um, execution uh, is really focused on the front line. And so um, are you uh, engaging with the front line? Uh, are you measuring the outcomes? Are you feeding uh, the outcomes and, and the customer uh, feedback back to the front line? Uh, are you actually listening to the front line and getting their ideas on how to um, improve a process or a policy or even an idea for a, um, a, a product feature uh, or um, some kind of a, an upgrade? And so that frontline engagement um, is where a lot of executives are just, they're just uncomfortable with, with that. And that's, so that's, that's something we get involved with quite a bit. Fantastic. Good stuff. Yeah, we love it. We, uh, I love my job. I uh, love, love working with the, the brands. I really love working with the brands who are just bought in like, like, and, and we, so we work with brands who are at the top and are just looking to build a bigger moat. But we also work with brands who are just in the basement and they want to get out. Uh, but really love working with those teams who are um, totally committed. Uh, and um, one, one of the things that we're seeing is that the, the role of customer service and customer satisfaction uh, in strategy is just becoming more and more important over time uh, because um, products and services are becoming so good uh but they're also becoming kind of it's a little bit of a commodity because they're they're kind of becoming you know the same like in the wireless industry uh the quality of the network used to be a huge issue uh, today the the networks are, are are fairly uh equal in terms of quality i mean there, there there's there are distinctions uh but um really the way to compete and to win uh is around uh that customer experience that you're delivering Today, we're talking with Mike Vermillion. He's the Senior Managing Director of uh, Global Business Intelligence with J.D. Power & Associates. And uh, it's great to have you with us today. Guys, great to be here. And uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, listening to the podcast as well. Yeah, it was great having you on. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Innovation Junkies podcast. Thank you for joining. Feedback from listeners like you helps us create outstanding content. So if you like this episode, be sure to rate us or leave a review. Also, don't forget to subscribe to get the latest growth and innovation strategies. Thanks for tuning in to the Innovation Junkies podcast.